wanted to submit questions in Chinese or Spanish, please feel free to do that. We have translators standing by, so we'll translate the questions for Jeff and I. We can't quite answer them in Chinese or Spanish, but staff will be providing you answers in follow up after this conversation. So again, thank you for joining us. And without further ado, if we can view the video, that would be great. Welcome to the SFMTA Online Budget Open House. To provide your input or ask a question about the key transportation decisions to be made for fiscal years 2021-2022, please email sfmtabudget at sfmta.com, call 415-646-2222, or tweet at sfmta underscore muni and hashtag SFMTABUDGET. 欢迎参加交通局网上公开会议讨论预算事宜。如果要发表意见或就二零二一至二零二二年预算和相关的交通运输重要抉择提出问题，请电邮至 sfmtabudget@sfmta.com， 致电四一五六四六二二二二。或推特 at sfmta muni hashtag sfmta budget。Maligayang pagdating sa sfmta online budget open house upang maibigay iyong input o tanong tungkol sa mga pangunahing decision sa transportasyon na gagawin para sa taong dalawang libot dalawang put isa hanggang dalawang libot dalawang put dalawa mangyari mag-email sa SFMT budget at sfmt.com o tumawag sa 415-646-2222 o mag-tweet ng at sfmta underscore muni or hashtag sfmta budget. Bienvenidos a la Casa Abierta Digital sobre el presupuesto de la Agencia Municipal de Transporte. Para proporcionar sus ideas o hacer preguntas sobre las decisiones claves de transporte que se llevarán a cabo para los años fiscales 2021 a 2022, por favor de enviar un correo electrónico a sfmtabudget.com o un tweet a arroba sfmta-bajo M U N I hashtag S F M T A B U D G E T. Welcome to the SFMTA Online Budget Open House. To provide your input or ask a question about the key transportation decisions to be made for fiscal years 2021-2022, please email sfmtabudget at sfmta.com, call 415-646-2222, or tweet at SFMTA underscore MUNI and hashtag SFMTA BUDGET. 欢迎参加交通局网上公开会议讨论预算事宜。如果要发表意见或就二零二一至二零二二年预算和相关的交通运输重要抉择提出问题，请电邮至 SFMTA Budget。at sfmta.com， 致电四一五六四六二二二二，或推特 at sfmta muni hashtag sfmta budget。Maligayang pagdating sa SFMTA Online Budget Open House。Upang maibigay iyong input o tanong tungkol sa mga pangunahing decision sa transportasyon na gagawin para sa taong 
hanggang 2022 mangyari mag-email sa sfmtbudget at sfmt.com o tumawag sa 415-646-2222 o mag-tweet ng at sfmta underscore muni o hashtag sfmta budget. Bienvenidos a la Casa Abierta Digital sobre el presupuesto de la Agencia Municipal. Hi, I'm Jeff Tumlin, San Francisco's Director of Transportation. Our agency is working on our next two-year budget, which is the ultimate reflection of our agency's values. These values include running a safe, equitable transportation system, reducing our carbon footprint, and creating a welcoming workplace that delivers excellent customer service. These goals are important, and we're making progress on operationalizing these values, but I also want to acknowledge that we're coming up short on several key issues. These include street safety, muni reliability, and congestion. We plan to address these issues in our next two-year budget, but to do so, we have some tough choices to make. We recognize that we're in an extraordinary time that will, without question, impact our budget outcomes. But we must continue to plan and discuss the trade-offs that we want to see reflected in the budget we pass within the next month. I'm going to go over some of the details of our budget. If you want to see this content more clearly or in another language, you can see it at sfmta.com slash budget. Before we can move toward the transformative system we want, we need to get back to basics. I ride transit in my bike every day in San Francisco, and I see these issues on the street daily. I especially experience the most common frustration that Muni is unreliable. While Muni service covers the city and is scheduled to run frequently, it doesn't always show up when we expect. Now that I've been on the job almost 100 days, I'm seeing the roots of these problems. It includes the fact that we have a thousand job vacancies, which means less transit service on the street to meet current demands. Traffic fatalities are not decreasing fast enough and affect our most vulnerable populations the most. Auto speeds have declined 20% over the last decade, and while our investments in transit have helped some lines, our buses and trains have slowed by about 6%. I believe because of all these things, we are seeing a decline in our most efficient modes and an increase in driving. All of this means that fewer people can move through our streets and greenhouse gas emissions continue to grow. We also have challenges with our budget. Our costs, like yours, rise with the cost of living, but our revenues have not kept pace. Our costs reflect the need to pay our workforce a living wage, which is particularly challenging given the housing shortage. As a result, as our budget grows, so does our structural deficit. In the next fiscal year, we are projected to have an operating gap of $66 million. We will need to close that gap in order to have a balanced budget. A lot of our revenue comes from transit fares and parking and traffic fees and fines. But a significant portion, 35%, comes from the general fund. Over time, we have become more and more dependent on the city's general fund which ties service to the state of the economy. The agency's structural funding deficit and the need for ongoing sources of funds is not news. In the last five years, there have been multiple task forces that have identified significant funding gaps in our transportation system moving into the future. Together, we're going to need to solve for that because our city has been growing and is expected to continue to grow, adding 73,000 housing units and 275,000 new jobs in the next 20 years and increasing the number of daily trips by 36% to almost 6 million in 2050. Before we talk about the future and striving for a higher standard of service, I need to focus on the nuts and bolts that keep San Francisco running more reliably. The proposed budget reflects this by making strategic investments into the existing system as a down payment for the future, while being fiscally smart during these uncertain economic times. So let's talk about some of the specifics. Last year, the city established the Muni Reliability Working Group, a team of experts in transit service who detailed where Muni must invest to deliver the service already promised. They directed us to stabilize the current service and then develop and fund plans for growth to move towards a higher standard. This budget focuses on stabilizing the current service. This means, firstly, fixing our human resources department and getting more drivers on the road. Second, increasing maintenance staff and car cleaners. 
Third, increasing enforcement to keep transit and traffic flowing. And fourth, investing in reducing fatalities. These are strategic and critical investments to set the foundation for, for the future. That means implementing the rest of the Muni Reliability Working Group recommendations, like increasing service by 6.5% and a variety of other agency initiatives. And it means making improvements based on the Muni Service Equity Strategy. But I will be honest with you, these will require new ongoing revenue streams. It's that simple. Before we can talk about additional funding for transportation, you might be wondering, can we deliver on our existing proposal? While this agency has had its struggles, we are at a turning point because we can demonstrate where we've invested, we have seen results. Where we've made targeted investments in transit, we've seen ridership grow by as much as 60%. Where we've made safety improvements, we've had fewer crashes, and in some cases, reduced injuries to zero. Our plan is to continue delivering the kind of projects that have shown results that are reflected in our capital plan. As you know, the streets quick build projects have been wildly successful. Just look at our success in Market Street. Following that success, we're about to implement transit quick build projects. And we have many other capital projects in the works to improve transit, do state of good repair, and implement Vision Zero. With respect to Vision Zero, we are grateful to the voters for passing Prop D last year. We're using this new tax on ride hail like Uber and Lyft to fund Vision Zero quick build projects and signal hardware upgrades, like new and more visible traffic lights. In this current budget, we're proposing one-time funds for Vision Zero education, which is important in order to capitalize on our Vision Zero construction projects. But to make a meaningful long-term change, we'll need sustained revenue for non-capital Vision Zero work. Now let's talk about fares, because we know this is so important to so many of you. We have a current policy called indexing where fares go up in small amounts indexed to inflation and to the cost of living every year in order to avoid huge sporadic increases. As a, as a regular part of the budgeting process, we would have simply indexed all of our fares up the, at the same percentage. But based on community feedback, particularly around the goal of equity, we've developed a number of new fare scenarios that require some trade-offs. All of these fare scenarios need to be what we call revenue neutral. In other words, they cannot increase the budget gap I talked about earlier or force us to make transit service cuts. So that's where the trade-offs come in. I know this slide is complicated, so let me walk you through it. The gray box are today's fares. The blue box is what would happen under our existing indexing policy, where all fares increase by a certain percentage. The green and pink boxes show two different equity scenarios that would result in free muni for all youth and individuals struggling with homelessness, and also no increase in single ride full or reduced fare rides. We reviewed who uses which fare product, and we know, for example, that 50% of our full fare single riders are low income and 65% of them are minority. 37% of our single riders are low income and 66% of them are minority. But to fund these equity options requires trade-offs. In the green box, we're paying for equity through an increase in monthly passes at a rate higher than indexing, but which matches other urban transit agencies. In the pink box, we're paying for equity through eliminating most of the discount to Clipper users. People who use Clipper would pay almost the same fare as those paying in cash. Our customers' feedback about equity also included a call for free muni, not just for youth, but for all transit riders. While the desire for that is understandable, it will actually make our system less equitable. This sounds counterintuitive, so let me unpack it. Transit fares constitute about 20% of our budget. If we do not collect fares at all, we will need to eliminate 20% of our service. With less service on our streets and more crowding, People that can afford it might switch to other modes like driving or taking Uber or Lyft. But individuals who rely on Muni and don't have access to alternatives will be stuck with transit that is much worse. Let's also talk about fines. Fine adjustments are guided by our safety values. Behavior that is unsafe should carry a higher penalty than mere nuisances. While most fines were generally indexed by our automatic indexing policy, 
certain safety-related violations were increased to the maximum amount allowed by state law. Parking in a bike lane is going up by 14%. Riding a scooter on a sidewalk is going up by 39%. In addition to adjusting fines, we're also responding to widespread requests for more and better enforcement by increasing the number of parking control officers. Parking control officers can help manage congestion and improve transit reliability by working at congested intersections and making sure cars aren't blocking the box and thereby blocking transit vehicles. Let's also talk about parking demand. Parking pricing is used to ensure parking availability and manage demand, not to maximize revenue. But any revenue collected from parking goes back into the transportation system specifically to fund transit. Our policies state that if there is high demand during a certain time period, we should raise prices to ensure one or two spaces are available when you want to go to your favorite restaurant or store. When demand is low, we lower parking meter prices. We've recently looked at our parking policies and realized that they were a little outdated when it comes to evening metering and Sunday metering. We know that the demand for parking in many commercial corridors is high in the evenings. That is why we're proposing extending the time that meters are enforced to ensure that evening visitors can still find a space where they need one. We won't be doing this citywide or immediately. We're going to partner with local merchants associations to determine where extended meter hours make the most sense and to see how it works. We're also proposing enforcing parking meters on Sundays, where we'd follow a similar community and data-driven process to make sure it works for our residents, visitors, and faith communities. So back to the big budget picture. In order to stabilize current service and make the critical investments to set the foundation for the future, we are proposing to implement some of the Muni Reliability Working Group's recommendations, along with other targeted investments. However, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a structural deficit, a funding gap. In order to pay for these targeted investments, we will need to use some of our fund balance, a one-time source of money. This approach carries with it some amount of risk because it draws down our fund balance, and in a recession, new services without new ongoing revenues or of fund balance would lead to service cuts. Moreover, we now have to contend with uncertain economic times as a result of the coronavirus. But we are at a moment in time where not making these strategic investments would be a missed opportunity because they are a down payment on the future of our transportation system and they support our values of a safe and equitable system, a reduction of our carbon footprint, and creating a work culture that delivers excellent customer service. It is up to all of us to get to the reliable and equitable system we need. For us at MTA, this means making the system we have better and showing you that with specific measurable improvements proposed in this budget. Your travel will be easier and more reliable. And now I invite you to join me for a discussion of our budget. We have opened up the phone lines and are monitoring all of our social media channels. Please share your comments and questions with us. Thank you. Sue. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you again so much for joining us. And I want to just take this time to apologize for the delay that we had in starting this chat about our budget. We ran about 15 minutes late, so our sincere apologies as we worked out some technical difficulties and got our arms around how to hold these public engagements uh, in virtual reality. So again, our apologies and thank you so much for sticking with us um, during the delay. We will be extending, of course, uh, how much time we spent with all of you by 15 minutes to make sure we have a full hour to cover all of your questions. So with that, I want to begin by saying clearly, Jeff, the reality has completely changed for our budget in the last three weeks as a result of the pandemic. And our sources of revenue, whether it's our fares or from our parking operations, are completely depleted and have practically disappeared. And Honestly, we actually are not really sure when we're going to see them come back. So given our current reality that we're facing, what is the agency doing about it? 
Yeah, uh, so this is the thing that keeps me uh, up late at night every night, trying to figure out um, how do we get through uh, the ways in which the health crisis um, is turning into an unprecedented financial crisis uh, for our agency. Uh, and uh, in addition to the like all of the re revenue sources that we control, which uh, fund the bulk of our, our budget, uh, the um, city's general fund is also taking a huge hit. Uh, hotel taxes are down nearly to zero. Uh, retail sales are down significantly. Business transfer taxes. Um, so we know uh, the city is in for tough economic times, um, and we are doing everything that we can in order to really do two things. Uh, one is uh, preserve our workforce, make sure that we don't lose our people um, because we need our people to do the second thing we need to do, which is to maintain uh, critical services for the public. Uh, that said, we are trimming everywhere we can. We are dramatically reducing contracts and procurement. We're cutting overtime everywhere except for the most essential workers um, like our, our car cleaners. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing that we're doing, uh, which is a little ironic, is continuing our budget process, the one that we started in a very different economy just a couple of months ago. Um, and that is the previous discussions about our budget were rooted in a conversation about what our agency's values are so that we could make decisions about how to spend our expected increase in revenues in order to improve services. Ironically, all of the work that we done that we'd done around uh, clarifying our values and understanding how to deal with tensions and trade-offs, all of that work applies in a time of cuts as it does in a time of expansion. So we're wanting to move forward in these uncertain budget times because we need an essential reference point. We constructed this entire budget starting with clarity in our values and then a very deep conversation about how we address tensions and trade-offs, particularly to deliver on an equity objective. We need those clarifications as the starting place for figuring out what it is that we're gonna do moving forward. So we know for certain that we're not gonna be able to project perfectly the economic situation we're gonna be in six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. So what we need is clarity about how we make the hard choices. And that's why we're moving forward right now. We also know with a fair amount of certainty, well, actually where we're gonna be six months from now because we track every single one of our revenue streams rather precisely. Uh, and we know what the trend lines look like. Um, so we don't know to what degree this is going to trigger a national or global recession, but we know where things stand now, and it's going to be a while before those revenue sources uh, uh, turn back to normal. So that's that's what we're doing now. Good. Well, speaking of revenue sources, we all know that Congress passed a federal relief package. And in that package, there's $25 billion for transit agencies such as ours, of which $1.3 billion is going to go to the Bay Area transit agencies. Can you share with us what the plan is for those funds? Yeah, and first of all, we are so grateful to our congressional delegation and particularly Speaker Pelosi, who fought personally very hard to have the federal stimulus package include transit operations. This is the, the kind of money that we most need. Um, operating dollars are how we pay our workforce and our workforce is how we deliver service. So what we're finding right now, so we have got a fiscal year that ends at the end of June. Um, we will lose about $200 million uh, between uh, the beginning of the COVID crisis and the end of June. Uh, the federal stimulus doesn't cover all of that. Uh, so we're going to use uh, the uh, big portion of the federal stimulus along with all of the other cuts that I talked about along with about 100 other small things um, in order to make sure that we can close out this fiscal year without layoffs. Um, and we're going to be probably very rare among transit agencies that can get to the end of June without layoffs. Um, other transit agencies that are highly fare box dependent um, or don't have access to other sources of revenue uh, are going to have to make deeper cuts uh, than we do. Um, we're also really fortunate, and we should probably talk about this as well, 
um, that thanks to the good management practices of my predecessors, including the whole budget office, which is still here, um, the SFMTA has a sizable reserve fund or a rainy day fund. Um, it's now raining uh, and we're going to have to tap our reserves in order to get through uh, the beginning of uh, this budget season uh, in order or the, the beginning of next year, the next uh, fiscal year in order to be able to continue to deliver service. Um, but uh, but we don't know what happens after that. Uh, things get um, more uncertain the farther out this gets um, if we don't see some economic stabilization or recovery soon. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the specific things um, that we have heard from members of the public. We have been doing public outreach since the beginning of this calendar year and lots of people have participated in it. And so we've tabulated all the feedback to date and I wanted to share the results with you. So as you can see from this pie chart, uh, there are four really main topics that we heard about and those were fares at almost 30%. Lots of people were interested in fares and of course asked us not to increase fares. We also heard from lots of folks the desire to see more muni service, which would be great. Although of course, as we've just discussed, our economic um, situation is not looking very well. So we'll, I'll be honest and say we probably can't provide additional muni service at this time. And then about 15% of folks or so talked to us about the extended meter hour proposal. And then a significant portion of comments really asked us to look at our towing and our fees on towing and maybe even our policy on towing. So at the top of the hour, the video that we shared really covered muni fares and additional muni service and covered the extended meter hours. But what we hadn't talked about yet is the towing. Can you talk about what's in our budget proposal as it relates to towing? Yeah, so this is actually a source of a lot of public comment, um, including some very passionate, and very personal stories um, at the SFMTA board meeting. Um, staff uh, listen to that very carefully. Um, and um, many of us here at the agency, myself included, um, have spent time living in our cars. So we understand um, how um, important this issue is. And so one of the places where we're starting is with the realization that uh, SFMTA loses a lot of money on the tow program. Um, none of our tow fees cover our costs. And so where we're starting is trying to minimize the amount of towing that we're doing. We're every place where we're towing cars, we're asking why are we towing cars from there? Um, so that we can shrink the size of the tow towing program and really, really minimize uh, the number of toes where people are surprised by the toe. The other thing that we heard a lot from is from uh, individuals uh, who have uh, in the past or currently experiencing homelessness and have had their cars towed. Um, if you're in, in San Francisco at this time and you're barely making it by being able to live in your car, the last thing we want is to force people out on the street because we've towed their home. Um, so we're wanting to, first of all, uh, eliminate that to the extent that we can. And if we inadvertently uh, end up doing so because the car is um, uh, creating a safety hazard uh, for individuals who are enrolled in city homeless services, we're eliminating the tow fee entirely so that the tow fee goes down, the tow or the boot fee goes down to zero. Uh, we're also uh, significantly reducing uh, the tow and boot fees uh, for folks who are low income or who are uh, uh, being towed for the first time. Uh, it's sort of a San Francisco car owner rite of passage to have your car towed once and then you learn not to do that again. We don't want to be punitive around our tow program. Uh, what we want to do is to keep the streets safe. Um, so that's uh, there's a lot more detail that you can see in the detailed budget package um, at sfmta.com slash budget uh, that outlines um, all of the details of those programs. But it's a it's a probably a pretty good example of how our agency's values are being reflected in this budget by um, a significant pivot towards equity in our tow programs. 
Very good. Okay, I want to go through some of the questions that we're getting on YouTube. Heidi P is asking, do parking permits go up by the same amount as the Muni fares? And why is parking so much cheaper than a Muni pass if we're frankly a transit first city? Yeah, so this is one of these things that drives me absolutely nuts uh, in San Francisco. So our residential parking permit uh, stickers uh, basically cost 30 cents a day. So cars get deeply discounted rent uh, when we have them park on city land on city streets. Um, unfortunately, it's against the law for us to raise those permit prices because we are only allowed to charge what it costs to administer the program. Um, and so in some parts of San Francisco, like uh, you know, on the west side near the big universities, the residential parking permit program is a very useful tool that helps limit spillover parking and makes it easier for residents to find a parking space near their home. That, like there, it's working well. But in the more urban parts of the city, like in Hayes Valley, um, we sell far more residential stickers than we have on street parking spaces. And so the residential sticker is just a hunting license. It doesn't actually provide any useful guarantee that somebody coming home late at night can find a parking space anywhere near their house. Um, so one of the things that we're going to want to do in, uh, in the coming year is to ask some hard questions about where the residential permit program is working and where it's not. And if we need to use new mechanisms to balance supply and demand, like uh, changing the rules or the law so that we can use price to balance supply and demand and to have that price reflect the actual rent of that eight by 20 foot piece of city land that we're giving away practically for free. Uh, but I certainly, uh, I certainly hear you. Uh, why are we charging nearly nothing uh, to provide nearly free rent on very expensive city land while we charge $3 for uh, three square feet of space on a crowded 38 Geary bus? Okay, moving on to some other questions we have here. Toshio Miranek posted on Twitter, and I've actually heard similar yep. questions from other people. Um, with respect to charging for Muni right now. So the question goes, you know, you could do what BTA, what Sam Trans and AC Transit is doing, free fares, public transportation is a public good, but SFMTA keeps running like it's a business. Why? And so I kind of want to break that down a little bit into there's like two yep. separate questions in there, I yep. think. One is, why don't we have free fares right now during this pandemic, during this health emergency? Wouldn't it help to keep our operators safe due to social distancing? So I think that's question number one. Mm -hmm. And then question number two is a little bit more bigger in nature, and we've heard this a lot during these budget conversations with the public. Why don't we just offer free muni for all. Yeah, OK, so I'm glad you actually broke that down into two questions. So on the operator safety side, SFMTA is unique among almost any transit agency in the United States in that our operators haven't collected fares for years. We're a proof of payment system. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, clipper card reading machines at all doors. Um, and more importantly, we have a plexiglass security barrier uh, that uh, is pretty unique to SFMTA. Um, we have mandated that operators uh, close the security barrier to separate them from the rest of the vehicle uh, in order to protect them. Um, we've also uh, recently changed the rules in collaboration with our partners of the Transit um, Workers Union to direct passengers to use the rear doors except for passengers who need the front door because they're in a wheelchair or they need uh, the, the, the kneeling uh, to be able to step up into the, into the bus. So we're allowing our vulnerable passengers in the front, everyone else in the back. Um, that is providing a far higher level of protection for our operators than is possible at almost any other agency. So there's no need for us to stop fare collection, which is uh, basically the reason why agencies like AC Transit stop fare collection is because they don't have card readers in the back. Now, the other question is very different, which is why do we charge immunity fare at all? Um, and um, part of this question is perfectly reasonable. Like, you know, we let people drive on our streets for free. Why do we charge people to take the most efficient form of transportation? And part of the answer has to do 
um, with the way our uh, our budget is constructed and why we're having this conversation as part of the budget. Free Muni has a lot of popular appeal. I understand that, but our transit fares represent 20% of our budget. So in order to provide free Muni for everyone, we would have to eliminate 20% of our transit service. Um, when we talk to our riders, and we've been having a lot of conversations over the last months with our riders, one of the things that is super clear to almost everyone that we talk to, when we ask them the question, like, do you want uh, free Muni or do you want better Muni? What is more important, freeness or speed and reliability? Um, and almost universally, uh, and particularly from our most transit dependent riders, the priority is better, better faster, more frequent, more reliable service. And this question is even more important when you actually look at the demographics of our riders. Um, San Francisco is unusual, uh, particularly here in the United States, in that most of our riders actually have moderate to high incomes. So if we cut service, in order to provide free fares for everyone, what we're actually doing is subsidizing rich people by cutting service to poor people. This creates terribly inequitable outcomes because rich people have other choices. Uh, if you know transit were cut for me, I could ride my fancy bike or take a taxi in order to get to work. Uh, lower income people don't have those choices. So in order to actually create a more equitable system, we have to prioritize better service. And more importantly, if we're going to be directing subsidies in order to provide more equitable outcomes, we need to direct those subsidies to the people who need it the most. That is uh, expanding discount transit service to low income people and providing free transit service to lowest income people and to uh, our local children uh, and, and homeless people who absolutely need it the most. So what we're trying to do is to create a budget that is less about popular appeal and more about actual social equity outcomes. Now in the long run, uh, I would hope someday we don't have to make that zero sum choice, that we don't have to choose between better service or free fares. Uh, given our current budget reality, we have to make that choice. In a better future, in a utopian San Francisco, we would actually have the resources that we need to deliver excellent transit service that San Francisco needs and not have to rely upon our fares. Um, we're probably a long ways from that, and in order to fund something like that, we have to have a conversation about difficult topics like downtown congestion pricing. Um, so if you're interested in how we might actually make free transit work, um, go to the uh, SFCTA website, the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, our sister agency, um, which is leading a downtown congestion pricing study right now. Obviously, their reality has changed as well. Um, but if you Google SFCTA downtown congestion pricing, uh, that study will come up and it will tell you how you can participate and actually maybe coming up with a transportation system um, that uh, is what San Francisco needs and is uh, far more equitable than what we've got now. Now, you just mentioned possibly taking a taxi, which is great. So we would be remiss if we really didn't talk about our taxi industry. Yeah. Um, it was suffering way before the health crisis even happened. And many people have asked this online and in other forums that are bored throughout many months. What is our agency doing yeah. to really support this very important industry. Yeah, so um, I want to make it really clear that I am personally a huge fan of the San Francisco taxi cab industry, and I am committed to ensuring a viable, financially a financially viable path forward for the taxi industry um, that also provides a living wage for uh, 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 taxi drivers. Um, this is more important to me now than ever, particularly given uh, the fact that we have no regulatory control over Uber and Lyft. Um, and Uber and Lyft um, are not finding a way, for example, to serve our wheelchair passengers in a way that the taxis do. Um, they also uh, uh, are, are not uh, contributing enough uh, 
compared to the impacts that they create on our streets. So I want to make sure that the taxi industry can compete successfully, um, particularly in an economic uh, return. And so we are doing an awful lot right now, including deferring basically all of the fees that taxi drivers uh, pay for their, uh, their, their permits and so on. Uh, trying to increase the use of taxis for city trips so that we can actually save money by getting rid of our fleet vehicles and having uh, uh, city department trips uh, taken uh, on taxi cabs. We are working really hard um, given the complex reality that uh, the taxi oper operators are experiencing with the um, San Francisco Federal Credit Union that uh, holds the, the loans that they have on their taxi medallions, trying to get the credit union to uh, defer uh, uh, payment on some of those loans during this uh, particular uh, economic crisis. We're lowering insurance requirements so that the operators can save some money, uh, and we're changing a lot of the small rules uh, uh, necessary um, uh, to make it easier for uh, the taxi operators to get by. We are also ready um, once the legal situation with the San Francisco Federal Credit Union is finally resolved um, to ensure that there is a strong market for taxi medallions again um, and that we make the system work and we make it competitive. Okay. Moving on along to some of our other questions uh, from Desert Flyer, we have I have trouble getting around at night on the sidewalk because all the cars are parked on the sidewalk. Staff told me they only enforce when I complain. Can you budget for proactive enforcement, please? <laughs> yes. Um, so one thing, there's a lot of rumors out there. Let me make it really clear. It is never legal to park a car on a San Francisco sidewalk. You should not do that. You should not do that for two minutes while you're running in. Um, please do not park on the sidewalk, particularly now uh, as we need to create space for social distancing as people are walking around um, San Francisco. Uh, there is still some uh, commu wrong communication, some old views from some people who've been around in San Francisco from previous eras in which parking on the sidewalk was tolerated. It is not in this jurisdiction. Um, so uh, in our original budget, we actually included substantial increase in parking control officers uh, because we use them to do 100 different things, not just enforcing parking, but also uh, managing traffic so that our buses aren't stuck in congestion. Um, they are now working to uh, deal with traffic and to help out at most of the city hospitals. Uh, they're doing 100 things dealing with logistics right now uh, in uh, delivering supplies for COVID. Um, we love our parking control officers. Um, it is unclear uh, how many of them uh, we will be able to afford. Uh, and if we uh, do afford them, uh, uh, whether they'll be able to bring in enough revenue as the economy starts to recover um, in order to not only cover their costs, but also to, also to expand their services. Um, one of the limitations that we will still have is that the parking control officer shifts uh, are pretty um, concentrated into the times when the like the meters are running uh, and where they're based is around the places where we have them do enforcement where there's high traffic or uh, high numbers of parking meters. So sometimes it takes us a while to be able to send them out to the neighborhoods uh, to deal with complaints uh, and sometimes we just simply don't have any around uh, to be able to send them out. Um, we are asking now increasingly for them to um, site on site. Um, so rather than waiting for calls to actually um, site vehicles that are blocking the pedestrian way, uh, this is another way in which SFMTA uh, is being clear about its values and operationalizing those values. Um, so I, I can't promise uh, that I'm going to fix any of that re like really, really fast, but we're we're pointing in that direction. Excellent. I'm going to go to Yvette who sent us an email and she writes, do you know when the equity strategy improvements will be made to the bus line serving Sunnydale? She writes to us that our neighborhoods have been long neglected and many housing projects, as you and I know, are pending in the area, which will create, of course, an influx in people and a demand for additional service. I hope that the agency devotes some time and energy to this part of San Francisco. Yeah, so this, I'm uh, actually really glad, uh, Yvette, that you raised this question. Um, so there's a couple things that um, I'd urge all of you to look at. One is the Muni Equity Strategy, which you can Google and find online. 
Um, another, which is uh, a little bit, uh, it doesn't include the Sunnydale neighborhood, but it does include uh, the greater Bayview, is the Bayview Community Plan, which is also a key guiding document. Um, there's also uh, another uh, a set of documents you can find um, called the Muni Forward Program. Um, and you can see, for example, um, the huge improvements that we've made on the 9 San Bruno uh, in order to improve speed and reliability and frequency on the 9. Um, that has been met with uh, a huge increase in ridership, which like we'd hoped to solve some of the crowding problems on the 9. Uh, instead, what we've done is created a whole lot of new 9 riders, which is good, but we still need to do more. Um, so um, one of the reasons why we want to adopt this expansion budget is because the expansion budget focused a lot of effort on improving service in neighborhoods that need it the most, neighborhoods where uh, our, our residents have the fewest transportation choices. So that included changes, really, really significant changes on the 29 Sunset, which serves all of the southern neighborhoods, uh, including uh, Bayview, uh, all of the Excelsior, uh, all the way out to, well, really all of the schools in the southern half of the city, including City mm -hmm. College and SFSU, and then all the way up Sunset Boulevard um, to Baker Beach, serving the Sunset and the Richmond. Um, so improvements to the 29 Sunset, improvements to the 56 in order to make it more reliable right now. Um, I believe the 56 only has one bus on it. So when there is a surface problem on that bus, um, it basically destroys service on the 56, making it super unreliable. So while we're not going to fund any of those improvements anytime soon, what our values oriented budget does is it tells us where we should and should not be making service cuts. And so one of the things that we're committed to is that if we have to make service cuts, that the last place we make cuts is in the neighborhoods with the fewest mobility choices. And that particularly means parts of districts 10 and 11 um, that yes, we acknowledge have been neglected in the past and we want to correct for that. We're not gonna be able to make the um, expans expansion correction uh, anytime soon, but we can, um, we can uh, help with, uh, you know, uh, uh, not having it lose more and then uh, uh, setting up conditions to allow uh, our services where people need it the most to be the first that come back and get expanded. So that's, uh, that's probably a more detail than you wanted um, and not the full answer that you want, uh, but it is a commitment that we've made um, to the neighborhoods that need service the most. Absolutely. I'm going to go to some of our phone lines and Tim is asking us by phone, can you just discuss the status of crossing guards and what is ahead for them in the next budget cycle? And he's asking, what are the chances of expanding the program to 20 hours per week of service? So Tim is referencing the fact that yep. currently crossing guards um, don't work a fully full 20 hour work week. They work about 12 and a half hours in the morning for schools and then afternoon when kids leave. And so he's asking if we're going to expand the program and or go to 20 hours. Yep. Yeah. So this is a good question and sort of interesting trade off question. So we've got, um, I think we have about 200, 200 cross crossing guards. Is yep. it 200? Okay. Yep. I got that right. So we have about 200 crossing guards um, all over the city and uh, their schedules are concentrated right at the beginning of school and the end of school. And we, they're very popular. They're much beloved in the community. Um, I say hi to the Harvey Milk Academy uh, crossing guards every morning on my way to work, uh, or at least I did when there was still school in session. And, uh, and so part of the, qu the question is, do we use our limited resources in order to expand the number of crossing guards and the, therefore the number of schools that they can serve or to expand their hours? Uh, and in talking to the crossing guards, uh, most of them uh, are, you know, retired people. They're doing this to keep busy and to contribute to their community. They and the schools were really clear that they wanted to see more crossing guards at more schools um, rather than uh, paying crossing guards uh, during the middle of the day, uh, because frankly, we don't have that much work to do for them. Um, that our parking control officers couldn't already do. So it's a it's one of those those situations where, given limited resources, uh, expanding the program um, best serves the public good. Very good. 
Um, back to Twitter, um, Zach Deutsch Gross is asking us, um, Hi, SFMTA seems relevant to reassess the budget in six months when we have a more realistic picture of the state of transit and people can participate more easily. Do you have any thoughts on that? So the uh, the city has a sort of fixed two year budget cycle uh, and the official budget that we adopt on this schedule is the reference point for all future changes. We know that we are not going to guess our revenue numbers precisely, um, but they become uh, the the again the reference point that we pivot from when making adjustments to either higher or lower amounts of money. More importantly, the budget is a policy document, so it establishes the values that then inform how we deal with the inevitable tensions and trade-offs of how we allocate limited resources in order to best achieve the public good. So we want to adopt the policy framework uh, and we want to adopt uh, you know, critical policy related measures like uh, fares and fines and penalties, all of that stuff uh, we want to be able to do now. We will likely need to make adjustments as we go along. Um, we certainly will not be able to spend for proposals uh, if we don't have money to uh, to to spend. Like we, our budget has to balance because if our budget does not balance, we have to lay off our workforce, and that is the last thing that I want to do on my watch. Absolutely. OK, more from Twitter. Sarah Greenwald is asking, hey, did MTA have an emergency plan and what has MTA learned from this pandemic? She's also asking, how are you making this budget process accessible to the public now? Some, for example, do not have Internet access. Yeah, OK, so these are all good questions. Um, and one of the things that I'm so grateful for being at this agency for is that the my predecessors in our current budget office um, have uh, been good fiscal stewards um, setting aside a substantial rainy day uh, uh, fund uh, a reserve fund uh, for when there was a catastrophe um, we now have a catastrophe and uh, that reserve fund is going to save a lot of jobs uh, and i'm so grateful for it the other advantage that we have is um, is frankly the leadership of mayor london breed um, and the fact that we are a city department and we have arguably the best municipal health department in the country. Um, so their leadership uh, meant that San Francisco got started on the shutdown sooner than almost any other place did, and that is saving us. It's also meant that we've been able to collaborate with the Department of Public Health to have really, really clear plans in place for what happens when, as we knew would be inevitable, uh, SFMTA em employees tested positive for COVID-19. So uh, our, we activated our Department uh, Emergency Operations Center uh, promptly uh, into the crisis. We've been collaborating on a daily basis with the Department of Public Health, learning from the science, getting approval and guidance from them on all the details of our operations in order to protect our workforce. Um, and to do contingency planning for what happens. Um, so uh, I am really proud and I cannot claim credit for any of this, but I'm really, really proud that my colleagues um, have done such excellent advanced planning that is making our agency more secure in this crisis than almost any of our other counterparts elsewhere um, in the nation. Um, I've lost track of the other part of this question. What was that again? Um, in terms of having access to public process ah, in, the, yeah. in the age of where we're basically doing everything digitally. And yep. of course, as we know, some folks don't have access to the Internet. Yeah, and this is something we're wanting to be really sensitive to as well. So we've been, you know, since the COVID crisis happened, we we were we're probably the uh, as an agency having the biggest online presence. We've been uh, hosting our board meetings online. We've been uh, this is our second community town hall that we've done online. Um, we've also been doing a whole array of um, online uh, community organization meetings um, and for the public meetings, including this one, we know that not everyone has Internet. Most people have access to a telephone, so all of our public uh, meetings, including this one, there is a dial in number so that people who you know can't get online and can't see our faces can still hear the text 
um, and can call in on their telephone. In fact, we're getting a significant number of you know, people picking up their phone and calling in. Um, all of those phone calls are transcribed for us. In fact, Vic has been uh, reading some of them. We do want to make sure that people have a real opportunity to participate. And we also have been reliant uh, for some of our community based organizations like SOMCAN and uh, the Transit Writers Union and a variety of other social equity um, uh, organizations have been participating uh, by phone as well. Um, and we've, we've, we've still early in the crisis did um, some in person meetings with social distancing uh, with organizations like SOMCAM. Very good. Uh, I have a question from YouTube now. Travel by Transit asks, can you raise the tickets for safety violations and for RPPs? Uh, yes, so this is another complicated question. So again, if you go uh, to sfmta.com slash budget, you'll see all of the detailed proposals for how we're making adjustments to our uh, citation fees and fines. Some of those uh, fee and fine categories we have control over. Many of them we do not. Um, there are limits controlled by the state government where we can't either raise or lower, and the rules are very complicated. What we've tried to do where we can is to think about fees and fines. Well, first of all, the objective of fees and fines should never be either revenue, nor should the, the objective be punitive. Our primary objective should be getting people to pay their fair share and to do the right thing. That's the only reason why we have fees and fines. And then to the extent that we have fees and fines, we want to make sure um, that we look at them with an equity lens. So uh, a fine for something that is jeopardizing the safety of vulnerable users should be much higher than the fine for something that's simply an annoyance. Similarly, uh, the fine for overstaying your time limit for your 200 square feet of space for your parking limit, for your parking space, like the fine for overstaying the meter should uh, be greater than the fine for not paying your $3 muni fare for your three square feet of space. So what we're trying to do is to make sense of all of them to the extent that we can. Ultimately, we know that fixing the equity problems in fees and fines requires a state legislative strategy because the most important ones we do not have control over. Um, that is one of the reasons why the SFMTA has been leading um, at the State Vision Zero Task Force uh, in order to make sure that those fines for things that are jeopardizing the safety of vulnerable users um, are increased. Uh, and that the fines for stuff that is simply an annoyance or is punishing poor people are reduced at the state level and that we create an equity framework there that would allow San Francisco uh, to adopt that and to take it a couple steps further. Um, but I, as you can see, I'm a little passionate about this topic and really, really frustrated that we don't have the control that we need as a municipality in order to get it all right. But where we do have control, we've been very diligent. And for example, we are increasing fares for people double parking in a bike lane, which is a That's complete right. safety violation. To the state maximum to the state maximum and similarly where we have people riding scooters on the sidewalk that fair or that fine excuse me is going up as well. Yeah. So very good we're closing in uh, on our time and I just oh, yeah. wanted to take a minute and clarify uh, a little bit about the tow policy and say that the fee for first time tow is only eliminated for individuals experiencing homelessness yeah. um, as certified by SA. HSH, excuse me, and then um, the first tow fee is still in place for most others, although it was reduced for low income individuals. So just wanted to clarify that point. Um, we're at 1247, a little bit beyond. So first of all, just want to acknowledge again uh, that we ran a little bit late and apologize for that. Uh, we answered quite a few questions that we got online and on our phone lines. There are some questions remaining that we will be following up directly with folks that asked us after this meeting in the next couple of days. You should hear from us. Um, but to be respectful of everyone's time, just want to go ahead and close out the session and ask you, Jeff, do you have any closing thoughts and remarks given where we are with the health pandemic and with our budget? Yeah, so first of all, thank you all for putting up with this long wonkish uh, conversation. Uh, your input is, is really important to us and has very much shaped the work that we've done so far. And I want to repeat that the only relevant statement of any organization's values is its budget. 
um, this is an incredibly important exercise for us. And whether uh, our, our revenues are collapsing or expanding, we can only make good decisions about how we use our limited resources to uphold the public good if we're clear about our values um, and if we understand how to make the difficult trade-offs. Uh, for me, all I can do is promise uh, to continue to update the public, to be fully transparent, and really to be brutally honest. Uh, this is gonna be a really, really difficult two years, perhaps unprecedented uh, in the last 100 years. Uh, and the only way we're gonna get through this is by being honest, by being transparent, by engaging with the public, um, and by coming back to our core values to make the tough choices. So thank you all for joining us uh, and we'll be back with more information um, as, uh, as history unfolds. Indeed, thank you. Thank you and goodbye.